On August 19th, 2020, Russian politician Alexei Navalny was shooting this campaign video. He was in Siberia, one of the many places where in about three weeks there would be local and regional elections. But he wasn't running for office. He was urging people to vote out the ruling party, United Russia, led by the President Vladimir Putin. Мы с вами разберем, как можно победить эту ненасытную жабу, партию Единая Россия. И до тех пор, пока мы от них не избавимся, шансов на нормальную жизнь у нас нет. He's made many videos like this before, and they usually rack up millions of views. It's this ability to reach people via the internet that has helped make Navalny the face of Russia's opposition movement. Soon after making his case in Siberia, he got on a plane bound for Moscow. But the plane was suddenly diverted to Omsk. Navalny had been poisoned and collapsed on the plane. An investigation later revealed that he had been poisoned with Novichok, a highly toxic nerve agent that was developed by the Soviet Union in the 1970s. It was also used, likely by Russia, in 2018 to attack Sergei Skripal, a former spy. Navalny survived the assassination attempt and set off a movement unlike any in recent history. How did he do it? And why is he such a threat to Putin? The Soviet Union had collapsed just eight years earlier, and the new Russian Federation was slowly transitioning to democracy. Previously, Putin had been a spy in the Soviet KGB and head of the Russian Security Service, roles that shaped how he wanted to govern as president. So he was trying to remake Russia in the image of the KGB. Like if everything in the world could be as centralized, insular, and secretive as the KGB, it would work well. So in order to maximize his control, Putin surrounded himself with the most powerful elements in Russia, starting with the media. Police were sent into Russia's independent media companies, charging their owners and bringing newsrooms under state control. After federal television, it went on to regional television, and then from there it went to print newspapers, and then it was like a flesh-eating machine. Whatever it could see that was still alive and functioning independently, it would gobble up. This hid Putin's actions from the public, so he was able to go after another powerful element, Russia's elections. His regime manipulated who could run for office, and that typically meant Putin's party and a few fake candidates, sanctioned by the regime. This was designed to splinter the opposition vote. And on top of that, the vote counting is, is rigged. Meaning that it was nearly impossible to run against Putin or his party. And that United Russia had control of the central and local governments all across the country. But politicians weren't the only threat to Putin. He also went after Russia's oligarchs and their prominent friends to weed out some powerful critics. In the early 2000s, most of Russia's wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few very powerful men. Putin protected those that swore loyalty to him, and those who didn't were either arrested on trumped-up charges or mysteriously killed. So the most common way to get rid of somebody is to bring them up on embezzlement charges. Former Russian oil tycoon Mikhail Khodorkovsky has been found guilty of embezzlement. The Russian tycoon Boris Berezovsky convicted of embezzlement. A former Russian businessman, he was accused of embezzling money. Nikolai Glushkov. The cause of death is still unexplained. That's how the judiciary is weaponized. With the law on his side, within a decade, Putin insulated himself with the most powerful elements on all sides. And it was all held together by corruption. Corruption is a structural feature of the regime. It's not an inefficiency of the regime. It's not a drag on the regime. It's the core of the regime. According to a report, over $400 billion were lost to corruption in Russia between 2000 and 2008. But because Putin controlled the media, much of it was hidden, until a young lawyer named Alexei Navalny found a way to change that. In 2006, Navalny started a blog where he wrote about corruption. In 2010, he wrote that at least $4 billion was stolen out of the state-owned transportation company Transneft, and he had proof. He had bought stock in the company and was able to access internal documents that plainly showed how government money was funneled into offshore accounts owned by Transneft officials. And this was just the beginning. Navalny soon published investigations on corrupt oil schemes, land deals, and fraud at state-owned banks by Russian oligarchs and politicians. By posting straight to his blog, Navalny was circumventing state media to reveal corruption and expose Putin's regime in a way that Russians had never seen before, all while making a name for himself. 
Like he, he thought that corruption was something knowable. Yeah, you could learn about it, you could systematize it. And again, you could take it seriously. And I said, you know what? I think we now have an actual politician in this country. In 2011, huge protests erupted when Putin's party won a majority in parliament, despite reports of voter fraud. It was the largest wave of demonstrations Putin's regime had ever faced, and Navalny was one of the main organizers. He was building on his investigations by speaking out publicly against corruption. State television ignored the protests, even as police arrested more than a thousand people and went after the organizers. One of the other ones was jailed, uh, several were forced into exile, one was murdered by Iskintsov, and Navalny was kind of the last guy standing. Over time, he developed a talent for organizing protests and gained a following. Then in 2013, he ran for mayor of Moscow, and it stirred some controversy. He had participated in Russian nationalist marches in the past and used ethnic slurs when referring to Russian minorities. But people were still drawn to the main message of his campaign. State TV didn't give his campaign any airtime, so he relied on rallies, online crowdsourcing, and an army of volunteers to spread the word. But just as he was gaining momentum, police arrested him on trumped-up charges of embezzlement and sentenced him to five years in jail. His supporters flooded the streets in protest. Navalny was eventually released on bail and didn't win the election, but he went on to finish second place. He continued to expose corruption through his YouTube videos, like this one in 2017 on the extreme wealth of Putin's ally Dmitry Medvedev. Плёская дача, горная резиденция, родовое гнездо в Курской области, агробизнес там же, дома на Рублёвке, виноградники, старинные особняки. It reached millions and sparked another round of protests. At the same time, Navalny was running for office again, this time against Putin for president. Я лучше Путина, потому что хочу освободить вас от этого и сэкономить ваши деньги. Predictably, the regime struck back and disqualified him based on previous embezzlement charges, further revealing just how rigged Russia's laws and elections were. But in 2020, Navalny found a way to take on the whole electoral system. He called it smart voting. Instead of letting the opposition vote splinter among several dummy candidates, Navalny identified one candidate and urged people to vote for the same one, even if they were backed by Putin's regime. It takes an incredible amount of public trust and charisma to get people to unify behind a meaningless candidate. But it's true that if you get enough people to do it, it actually can add up to, to meaningful resistance. And it terrifies the crowd. During that time, Navalny was the second most popular politician in all of Russia, according to some polls, while Putin's favorability ratings were slipping because of his struggling economy. That made Navalny a threat, and it explains why he was poisoned possibly more than once. He was very weirdly ill, and once his wife Yulia was very weirdly ill, they were looking for an opportunity, a place, and a time. And it was finally, like, it seemed almost perfect, but I think they did expect that they'd be rid of him by now, and they're not. After the Siberia attack, Navani recovered in a German hospital where he miraculously survived. A few months later, he went back to his investigations. In December 2020, he tricked the secret agent who poisoned him into revealing how he did it. Then in January, he returned to Russia, knowing he'd be arrested. Police met him at the airport and charged him with violating the parole from his 2014 embezzlement case. But while detained, his team released another video, this one attacking Putin directly. It's been viewed over a hundred million times. His supporters flooded the streets in over a hundred cities across Russia. A few days later, Navalny was sentenced to two years and eight months in prison, sparking even more protests. Police have arrested more than 5,000 people, while state media has downplayed it. Even though Navalny ended up in prison again, his movement continued to play out on the streets. 